And we shall start. Hold on. My hair. We shall start getting into this book. Also, Lilith, I did not mean it as a joke. You guys are whatever you... Against your will, you are now my adopted children. Um, I'm pretty sure there's a uh, Nightbot command you do, exclamation point, your mom. I'm pretty sure that's the command. I don't know. I didn't make it. But anyways, let's get into chapter 11. <clears throat> His training with the assassin must have paid off because Archer was across the carriage and brandishing a hidden dagger between them before she could blink. Please, he breathed, his chest rising and falling in uneven patterns. Please, Lena. She opened her mouth, ready to explain everything, but he was gasping down breaths, his eyes wide. I can pay you. A small, wretched part of her was fairly smug at the sight of him cowering, but she held up her hands, showing him she was unarmed, at least as far as he could see. The king thinks you're part of a rebel movement that's interrupting his agenda. A harsh, barked laugh so raw that none of the smooth, lovely man was even recognizable in the sound. I'm not a part of any movement. Word damn me, I might be a whore, but I'm not a traitor. She kept her hands where he could see them and opened her mouth to tell him to shut up, sit down, and listen. But he went on. I don't know anything about a movement like that. I haven't even heard of anyone who dare try to get in the way of the king. But, but, his panting evened out. If you spare me, I can feed you information about a group that I no is starting to gather power in Riftle. The king is targeting the wrong people? I don't know, he said quickly. But this group, this one, he'd probably want to know more about. It seems like they recently learned that the king might be planning some new horror for us all, and they want to try to stop him. If she were a nice, decent person, she'd tell him to take the time to calm himself, to right his mind. But she wasn't a nice, decent person, and his panic was giving his tongue free rein. So she let him go on. I've only heard my clients whispering about it every now and then, but there's a group that's formed right here in Riftold, and they want to put Aelin Galathinius back on Terrison's throne. Her heart stopped beating. Aelin Galathinius, the lost heir of Terrison. Aelin Galathinius is dead, she breathed. Archer shook his head. They don't think so. They say she's alive and that she's raising an army against the king. She's looking to reestablish her court to find what's left of King Orland's inner circle. She just stared at him, willing her fingers to unclench, willing air into her lungs. If it were true, no, it wasn't true. If these people actually claimed to have met the heir to the throne, then she had to be an imposter. Was it mere coincidence that Nehemia had mentioned Terrison's court that morning? That Terrison was the one force capable of standing against the king? If it could get to its feet again, with or without the true heir, but Nehemia had sworn to never lie to her. If she'd known anything, she would have said it. Also, I am so sorry. I realized Chaz redeemed cat ears earlier, and I got so distracted I never put them on. So, here they are. I am sorry. Anyways. <clears throat> uh, then she had to... Uh, if she'd known anything, she would have said it. Elena closed her eyes. Though she was aware of Archer's every movement. In the darkness, she pulled herself together, shoved down that desperate, foolish hope until nothing but an ageless fear blanketed again. She opened her eyes. Archer was gaping at her, his face white as death. I have no intention of killing you, Archer, she said. He sagged against the bench, releasing his grip on the dagger. I'm going to give you a choice. You can fake your own death right now and flee the city before dawn, or I can give you till the end of the month, four weeks. Four weeks to discreetly get your affairs in order. I assume you have money tied up in Rifthold, but the time comes at a cost. I'll keep you alive only if you can get me information about whatever this terrorist and rebel movement is, and whatever they know about the king's plans. At the end of the month, you will fake your death and you will leave this city. Go someplace far away and never use the name Archer Finn again. He stared carefully warily at her. I'll need the rest of the month to untangle my money. 
He loosed a breath, then rubbed his face with his hands. After a long moment, he said, Perhaps this is a blessing in disguise. I'll get to be free of Clarice and start my life anew elsewhere. Though he gave her a wobbly smile, his eyes were still haunted. Why did the king even suspect me? She hated herself for feeling such pity for him. I don't know. He just handed me a piece of paper with your name on it and said you were a part of some movement to upset his plans, whatever those may be. Archer snorted. I only wish I could be that sort of man. She studied him. The strong jaw, the broad frame, all suggested strength. But what she'd seen just now, that was not strength. Kale had known right away what sort of man Archer was. Kale had seen through the illusion of strength, and she hadn't. Shame heated her cheeks, but she made herself speak again. You truly think you can uncover information about this, this movement from Terrison? Even though the heir had to be an imposter, the movement itself was worth looking into. Elena had said to look for clues. She might find some here. Archer nodded. There's a ball tomorrow night at a client's house. I've heard him and his friends murmuring about the movement. If I sneak it, you into the party, it might give you a chance to look around his office. Maybe you'll even find real traitors at the party, not just suspects. And some ideas about what the king might be up to. Oh, this information could be very useful. Send along the details to the castle tomorrow morning. Care of Lillian Gordana, she told him. But if this party turns out to be a load of nonsense, I'll reconsider my offer. Don't make me look the fool, Archer. You're Erebin's protege, he said quietly, opening the carriage door and keeping his distance as best he could while he exited. I wouldn't dare. Good, she said. And Archer? He paused, a hand on the carriage door. She leaned forward, letting a bit of that wicked darkness shine through her eyes. If I find out that you aren't being discreet, if you draw too much attention to yourself or attempt to flee, I will end you. Is that clear? He gave her a low bow. I am your eternal servant, milady. And then he gave her a smile that made her wonder whether she'd regret her decision to let him live. Leaning into the carriage bench, she thumped on the ceiling and the driver headed to the castle. Though she was exhausted, she had one last thing to do before bed. She knocked once, then opened the door to Kale's bedroom just wide enough to peer in. He was standing frozen before the fireplace, as if he'd been in the middle of pacing. Thought you'd be asleep, she said, slipping inside. It's past twelve. He folded his arm across his arms across his chest. His captain's uniform rumpled and unbuttoned at the collar. Then why bother stopping by? I thought you weren't coming home tonight anyway. She pulled her cloak tighter around her, her fingers digging into the soft fur. She lifted her chin. Turns out Archer wasn't as dashing as I remembered. Funny how a urine in Dovier can change the way you see people. His lips tugged upward, but his face remained solemn. Did you get the information you wanted? Yes, and then some, she said. She explained what Archer had told her, pretending that he'd accidentally given her the information, of course. She explained the rumors surrounding the lost heir of Terrison, but left out the bits about Aelin Galathinia seeking to reestablish her court and raise an army, and about Archer not really being in the movement. Oh, and about wanting to uncover the king's true plans. When she finished telling Kale about the upcoming ball, he walked up to the mantle and braced his hands against it, staring at the tapestry hanging on the wall above. Though it was faded and worn, she instantly recognized the ancient city nestled into the side of a mountain above a silver lake. Aniel, Kale's home. When are you going to tell the king? He asked, turning his head to look at her. Not until I know if this is actually real, or until I use Archer to get as much information as I can before I kill him. He nodded, pushing off the mantle. Just be careful. You keep saying that. Is there something wrong with saying it? Yes, there is. I'm not some silly fool who can't protect herself or use her head. Did I ever imply that? No, but you keep saying be careful and telling me how you worry and insisting you help me with things and- Because I do worry! Well, you shouldn't. I'm just as capable of looking after myself as you are. He took a step toward her, but she held her ground. Believe me, Selena, he snarled, his eyes flashing. I know you can look after yourself, but I worry because I care. Gods help me, I know I shouldn't, but I do. So I will always tell you to be careful, because I will always care what happens. She blinked. Oh, was all she managed. He pinched the bridge of his nose and squeezed his eyes shut, then took a long, deep breath. Selena gave him a sheepish smile. And that is the end of chapter 11.
way in. Don't spoil anything for the rest of chat. Oh, and by the way, exclamation, your mom, it's you are mom, not your mom. Your mom. At least I think that's the command. Let me try. Yep, we'll find out your mom now. Boogie, boogie, boogie. <laughs> <clears throat> okay. Let's jump right into chapter 12. The mask was held in a riverfront estate along the Avery, and was so packed that Selena had no trouble slipping in with Archer. Philippa had managed to find her a delicate white gown, made up of layers of chiffon and silk patterned like overlapping feathers. A matching mask obscured the upper half of her face, and ivory feathers and pearls had been woven into her hair. It was fortunate it was a masquerade and not a normal party, since she certainly recognized a few faces in the crowd. They were mostly other Cortesians she'd once known, along with Madame Clarice. During the carriage ride here, Archer had promised that Arab and Hamel wasn't attending, and neither was Lysandra, a Cortesian who, with whom Selena had a long, violent history, and someone she was fairly certain she'd kill if she ever saw again. As it was, just seeing Clarice floating through the party, arranging liaisons between her Cortesians and the guests was enough to set Selena on edge. While well, she had come as a swan, Archer had dressed as a wolf. His tunic pewter, his slender pants dove gray, and his boots shining black. His wolf mask covered all but his sensual lips, which were currently parted in a rather wolfish smile as he squeezed the hand she had on his arm. Not the grandest party we've ever been to, he said, but Davis has the best pastry chef in Ripple. Indeed. Throughout the room, tables were overflowing with the most beautiful, decadent-looking pastries she'd ever seen. Pastries stuffed with cream, cookies dusted with sugar, and chocolate, chocolate, chocolate beckoning to her everywhere. Perhaps she'd swipe a few before she left. It was an effort to return her gaze to Archer. How long has he been your client? That wolfish smile flickered. A few years now. Which is how I noticed the change in his behavior. His voice dropped to a whisper, the words tickling her ear as he leaned in. He's more paranoid, eats less, and holds up in his office any chance he gets. At the other end of the domed ballroom, massive windows faced a patio overlooking a glittering stretch of the Avery. She could imagine those doors thrown wide in summer, and how lovely it would be to dance alongside the riverbank under the stars and city lights. I have about five minutes before I need to make my rounds, Archer said, his eyes following Clarice as she patrolled the room. She'll expect an auction for me on a night like this. Selena's stomach turned over, and she found herself reaching for his hand. But he just gave her a bemused smile. Just a few more weeks, right? There was still enough bitterness that she squeezed her fingers reassuringly. Right, she swore. Archer jerked his chin toward a stocky, middle-aged man holding court with a group of well-dressed people. That's Davis, he said under his breath. I haven't seen much during my visits, but I think he might be a key leader in this group. You're assuming that based on glimpsing some papers in the house? Archer slid his hands into his pockets. One night, about two months ago, I was here when three of his friends came over, all of them clients of mine too. It was urgent, they said, and when Davis slipped out of the bedroom, she gave him a half smile. You somehow accidentally overheard everything. Archer smiled back, but it faded as he again looked at Davis, who was pouring wine for the people assembled around him including some young women who looked a year or two shy of 16. Selena, Selena's own smile vanished as well. This was a side of Riftold that she hadn't mi missed in the least. <clears throat> they spent more time ranting about the king than making plans. And regardless of what they might claim, I don't think they truly care about Aelin Galathinius. I think they just want to find a ruler who best serves their interests. And maybe they only want her to raise an army so their businesses can thrive during the war that would ensue. If they aid her, give her badly needed supplies, then she'd owe them. They want a puppet queen, not a true ruler. Of course, of course they would want something like that. Are they even from Terrison? No, Davis's family was years ago, but he spent his whole life in Riftold. If he claims any loyalty to Terrison, it's only a half-truth. She ground her teeth. Self-serving bastards. Archer shrugged. 
That may be true, but they've also rescued a good number of would-be victims from the king's gallows, apparently. The night his friends burst into the house, it was because they'd managed to save one of their informants from being interrogated by the king. They smuggled him out of Grifthold before dawn broke the next day. Did Kaol know about this? Given how he'd reacted to killing Cain, she didn't think torturing and hanging traitors were a part of his duties. Or were even mentioned to him. Or Dorian, for that matter. But if Kael wasn't in charge of interrogating possible traitors, then who was? Was this person the source who had given King the, the king his latest list of traitors to the crown? Oh, there were too many things to consider. Too many secrets and tangled webs. Selena asked. Do you think you can get me into Davis's office right now? I want to look around. Archer smirked. My darling, why do you think I brought you over here? He smoothly led her to a nearby side door, a servant's entrance. No one noticed as they slipped through, and if they had, Archer's hands roaming over her bodice, her arms, her shoulders, her neck, would suggest that they were going through the door for some privacy. A seductive smile on his face, Archer tugged her down the small hallway, then up the stairs, always taking care to keep his hands moving on her lest anyone see them. But all the servants were preoccupied, and the upstairs hall was clear and quiet, its wood-paneled walls and red carpeting immaculate. The paintings here, several from artists she recognized, were worth a small fortune. Archer moved with a stealth that probably came from years of sleeping in and out of bedrooms. He led her to a set of locked double doors. Before she could pull one of Philippa's pins from her hair to unlock it, a pick appeared in Archer's hand. He gave her a conspirator conspirator's grin. A heartbeat after that, the office door swung open, revealing a room scattered throughout. A large desk sat in the center, two armchairs before it, and a chaise sprawled near a darkened fireplace. Selena paused in the doorway, pressing on her bodice just to feel the slender dagger tucked inside. She brushed her legs together, checking the two daggers strapped to her thighs. I should go downstairs, Archer said, glancing at the hallway. Behind them. The sounds of a waltz floated up from the ballroom. Try to be quick. She raised an eyebrow, even though the mask covered her features. Are you telling me how to do my job? He leaned in, brushing his lips against her neck. I wouldn't dream of it, he said onto her skin. Then he turned and was gone. Selena quickly shut the door, then strode to the windows at the other side of the room and closed the curtains. The dim light shining beneath the door was enough to see by as she moved to the ironwood desk and lit a candle. The evening papers, a stack of response cards from tonight's mask, a personal expenses ledger. Normal. Completely normal. See, sure, she searched the rest of the desk, rifling through the drawers and knocking on every surface to check for trick compartments. When that yielded nothing, she walked to one of the bookcases, tapping on the books to see whether any were hollowed out. She was about to turn away when a title caught her eye. A book with a single word mark written on the spine in blood red ink. She pulled it out and rushed to the desk, setting down the candle as she opened the book. It was full of word marks, every page covered with them, and with words in a language she didn't recognize. Nehemi had said it was secret knowledge, that the word marks were so old they'd been forgotten for centuries. Titles like this had been burned with the rest of the books in the, on magic. She had found one place in the library, The Walking Dead. One in the palace library, The Walking Dead. But that had been a fluke. The art of using the word marks was lost. Only Nehemia's family knew how to properly use their power. But here, in her hands, she flipped through the book. Someone had written a sentence on the inside of the back cover, and Selena brought the candle closer as she peered at what had been scribed. scribbled. It was a riddle, or some strange turn of phrase. It is only with the eye that one can see rightly. But what in the hell did it mean? And what was Davis, some half-corrupt businessman, businessman, doing with a book on word marks, of all things? If he was trying to interfere with the king's plans. For the sake of Aurelia, she prayed the king had never heard, even heard of word marks. She memorized the riddle. She would write it down when she returned to the castle. Maybe ask Nehemia if she knew what it meant. Or if she'd heard of Davis. Archer might have given her vital information, but he obviously didn't know everything. Fortunes had been broken upon the loss of magic. People who had made their living for years by harnessing its powers were suddenly left with nothing. It seemed natural for them to seek out another source of power, even though the king had outlawed it. But what footsteps sounded down the hall? 
Selena swiftly put the book back on the shelf, then looked to the window. Her dress was too big, and the window was too small and high for her to easily make it out that way. And with no other exit, she locked the lock and the double doors clicked. Selena leaned against the desk, whipping out her handkerchief, blow bowing her shoulders, and starting a miserable sniffle sob as Davis entered his study. The short, solid man paused at the sight of her, the smile that had been on his face fading. Thankfully, he was alone. She popped up, doing her best to look embarrassed. Oh, she said, dabbing her eyes, dabbing at her eyes with her handkerchief through the holes in her mask. Oh, I'm sorry. I, I needed a place to be alone for a moment, and they said, sa they said I could come in here. Davis's eyes narrowed, then shifted to the key in the lock. How did you get in? A smooth, slippery voice, dripping with calculation and a hint of fear. She let out a shuddering sniffle. The housekeeper. Hopefully the poor woman wouldn't be played alive after this. Selena hitched her voice, stumbling and rushing through the words. My, my betrothed, l l l left m m me Honestly, she sometimes wondered if there was something a bit wrong with her for being able to cry so easily. Davis took her in again, his lip curling. Not out of sympathy, she realized, but from disgust at the silly, weepy woman sniffling about her fiancé. As if it would be a colossal waste of his precious time to comfort a person in pain. The thought of Archer having to serve these people, who looked at him like he was a toy to be used until he was broken. She focused on her breathing. She just had to get out of here without raising Davis' suspicions. One word to the guards down the hall, and she'd be in more trouble than she wanted might possibly drag Archer down with her. She let out another shudder sniffle. There's a ladies' powder room on the first floor, Davis said, stepping toward her, to escort her out. Perfect. As he approached, he pulled off the bird mask he wore, revealing a face that had probably been handsome in its youth. Age and too much drinking had pummeled it into saggy cheeks, thinning straw blonde hair, and a dull complexion. Capillaries had burst on the tip of his nose, staining it a purplish red that offset his watery gray eyes. He stopped close enough to touch her and held out a hand. She dabbed at her eyes one more time, then slipped her handkerchief back into her dress pocket. Thank you, she whispered, looking at the floor as she took his hand. I, I am sorry for intruding. She heard his sudden intake of breath before she caught the flash of metal. She had him disabled and on the floor in a heartbeat but not fast enough to avoid the sting of Davis's dagger slicing into her forearm. The yards of fabric that made up her dress were cumbersome as she pinned him to the carpet, a thin line of blood welling up and trickling down her bare arm. No one has the keys to this study, Davis hissed, despite his prone position. Brave or foolish? Not even my housekeeper. Selena shifted her hand, going for the points in his neck that would render him unconscious. If she could hide her forearm, then she could still slip out of here unnoticed. What were you looking for? Davis demanded, his breath reeking of wine as he wriggled against her hold. She didn't bother to answer, and he surged up, trying to dislodge her. She slammed her weight into him, lifting her hand to deliver the blow. Then he chuckled softly. Don't you want to know what was on that blade? She could have ripped his face off with her fingernails for the silken smile he gave her. In a smooth, swift moment, she snatched up his dagger and sniffed. She'd never forget that musky smell, not in a thousand lifetimes. Gloriella, a mild poison that caused hours of paralysis. It had been used the night she was captured to knock her down, to make her helpless to fight back as she was handed over to the king's men and thrown into the royal dungeons. Davis's smile turned triumphant. Just enough to knock you out until my guards arrive and bring you, a more, bring you to a more private location. Where she'd be tortured. He didn't need to add. Bastard. How much had she been exposed to? The cut was shallow and short, but she knew the glory yellow was already racing through her, just as it had on the days after she'd lain beside Sam's broken corpse, smelling the musky smoke still clinging to him. She had to go. Now. She shifted her free hand to knock him out, but her fingers felt brittle, disconnected, and despite being short, he was strong. Someone must have trained him, because in a too fast movement, he grabbed her wrists twisting her to the ground. She slammed into the carpet so hard the air was knocked from her lungs. Her head spun, and she lost her grip on the dagger. The Gloriella was acting fast, too fast. She had to get out. A bolt of panic went through her, pure and undiluted. 
Her confounded dress got in the way, but she focused what little control remained on bringing up her legs and kicking. So hard, he had let go for a moment. Bitch! He lunged for her again, but she'd already grabbed his poison dagger. A heartbeat later, he was clutching his neck as his blood sprayed on her, on her dress, on her hands. He collapsed to the side, grasping at his throat as though he could hold it together. Keep his life's blood from spewing. He was making a familiar gurgling noise, but Selena didn't give him the mercy of ending it as she staggered to her feet. No, she didn't even give him a parting glance as she took the dagger and ripped the skirts of her gown up to her knees. A moment after, she was at his office window, studying the guards and parked carriages below. Each thought fuzzier than the last as she climbed onto the ledge. She didn't know how she made it, or how long it took, but suddenly she was on the ground and sprinting toward the open front gate. The guards or footmen or servants started shouting. She was running, running as fast as she could, losing control of her body with each heartbeat that pumped the glory yellow through her. They were in the wealthy part of the city, near the Royal Theater, and she scanned the skyline, searching, searching for the glass castle. There! The glowing towers had never seemed more beautiful, more welcoming. She had to get back. Her vision blurring, Selena gritted her teeth and ran. She had enough awareness to snatch a cloak off a drunk dozing on a corner and wipe the blood from her face, even though it took several tries to keep her hands steady as she ran. Once the cloak concealed her ruined dress, she made for the main gates of the castle grounds, where the guards recognized her, though the lights were too dim for them to look closely. The wound had been short and shallow. She could make it. She just had to get inside, get to safety. But she stumbled on the winding road leading up to the castle, and her run turned into a staggering walk before she even got to the castle itself. She couldn't go in the front like this, not unless she wanted everyone to see, not unless she wanted everyone to know who was responsible for Davis's death. She swayed with every step as she made for a side entrance, where studded iron doors were left partially open to the night. The barracks. Not the best place to enter, but good enough. Maybe the guards would be discreet. One foot in front of the other, just a little farther. She didn't remember getting to the barracks doors, only the bite of the metal studs as she pushed them open. The light of the hall burned her eyes, but at least she was inside. The door to the mess hall was open, and the sounds of laughter and clinking mugs floated toward her. Was she numb from the cold, or was it the Gloriella taking over? She had to tell someone what antidote to give her. Just tell someone. One hand braced against the wall, the other holding her cloak tightly around her, she slipped past the mess hall, every breath lasting a lifetime. No one stopped her. No one even looked her way. There was one door down this hall that she had to reach, one room where she'd be safe. She kept her hand on the stone wall, counting the doors she passed. So close. Her cloak caught on the handle of a door as she passed by and ripped away. But she made it to that door, to the room where she'd be safe. Her fingers didn't quite feel the grain of the wood as she pushed against the door and swayed on the threshold. Bright light, a blur of wood and stone and paper, and through the haze, a face she knew, gaping at her from behind a desk. A choked noise came out of her throat, and she looked down at herself long enough to see the blood covering her white dress, her arms, her hands. In the blood, she could see Davis, and the open gash across his throat. Kale, she moaned, seeking that familiar face again. But she, he was already running, smashing through his office. He bellowed her name as her knees buckled and she fell. She saw only the golden brown of his eyes and held on long enough to whisper, Gloriella, before everything tilted and went black. And that was chapter 12. By your ratio of gravy to potatoes being off, do you have too much gravy or too much potatoes? <clears throat> okay. Pretty sure it's been more than 10 minutes, so the cat ears are coming off. Too much potatoes, they were a little too bland. Ah, gotcha. On to chapter 13. It was, it was one of the longest nights of Kaol's life. Every second has passed by with horrific clarity. Every agonizing second as Lena lay there on the floor of his office. 
Her bodice covered in so much blood that he couldn't tell where she was bleeding. And with all the stupid layers of frills and pleats, he couldn't see the entry wounds. So he'd lost it. Utterly lost it. There was no thought in his head beyond a roaring panic as he shut the door, took out his hunting knife, and ripped open her dress right there. But there were no wounds, only a sheathed stiletto that cladded, clattered to the floor and a scratch on her forearm. With the dress ripped away, there was hardly any blood on her, and that's when the panic cleared enough for him to remember what she'd whispered. Gloriella. A poison used to temporarily paralyze victims. Everything from then on became a series of steps. Quietly summoning Ress, telling the young, talented guard to keep his mouth shut and to find whatever healers were closest. Wrapping her in his cloak so no one could see the blood on her skin. Scooping her up and carrying her to her rooms. Barking orders at the healers and finally pinning her down on the bed as they forced the antidote down her throat. Until she choked on it. Then the long, long hours spent holding her as she vomited, twisting her back, hair back, snarling at anyone who entered the room. When she was sleeping soundly at last, he sat by her, still watching over her as he sent Rest and his most trustworthy men into the city and warned them not to come back without answers. When they did return and told them about a businessman apparently murdered by his own poisoned dagger, Kale pieced together enough of what had happened to be sure of one thing. He was glad Davis was dead, because if Davis had survived, Kale would have gone back to finish the job himself. Selena awoke. Her mouth was bone dry and her head pounded, but she could move. She could wiggle her toes and her fingers, and she recognized the smell of the sheets well enough to know that she was in her bed, in her room, and that she was safe. Her eyelids were heavy as she opened them, blinking away the blurriness that still lingered. Her stomach ached, but the Gloriella had worn off. She looked to her left, as if she'd somehow known, even in sleep, where he was. Kale dozed in the chair, his arms and legs sprawled out, his head tipped back, exposing the unbuttoned collar of his tunic and the strong column of his throat. From the angle of the sunlight, it was probably around dawn. Kale, she rasped. He was instantly awake and alert, leaning toward her, as if he, too, always knew where she was. When he saw her, the hand that had lurked toward his sword relaxed. You're awake, he said, his voice a dark rumble, laced with temper. How are you feeling? She looked at herself. Someone had washed away the blood and put her in a nightgown. Just moving her head made everything spin. Horrible, she admitted. He put his head in his hands, bracing his elbows on his knees. Before you say anything else, just tell me this. Did you kill Davis because you were snooping in his office? He caught you and then caught you with a drugged blade? A flash of teeth, a flicker of rage in those golden brown eyes. Her insides twisted up at the memory, but she nodded. Very well, he said, standing up. Are you going to tell the king? He crossed his arms, coming to the edge of the bed and staring down at her. No. Again, that volatile temper burned in his eyes. Because I don't feel like having to argue that you're still capable of spying without getting caught. My men will keep their mouths shut too, but the next time you do anything like this, I'm going to throw you in the dungeons. For killing him? For scaring the hell out of me! He ran his hands through his hair, pacing for a moment, then whirled, pointing at her. Do you know what you looked like when you showed up? I'll hazard a guess and say... Bad? A flat stare. If I hadn't burned your dress, I'd make you look at it right now. You burned my dress? He splayed his arms. You want proof of what you did lying around? You could get in trouble for covering for me like this. I'll deal with it if it comes to that. Oh, you'll deal with it? He leaned over the bed, bracing his hands on the mattress as he snarled in her face. Yes, I'll deal with it. She gulped, but her mouth was so dry she had nothing to swallow. Beyond his anger, there was enough lingering fear in his eyes that she winced. It was that bad? He slumped onto the edge of the mattress. You were sick. Really sick. We didn't know how much Gloriella was in the wound, so the healers erred on the safe side and gave you a strong dose of the antidote, which caused you to spend a few hours with your head in a bucket. I don't remember any of that. I barely remember getting back to the castle. He shook his head and stared at the wall. Dark smudges lay under his eyes, stubble coated his jaw, and utter exhaustion lined every inch of his body. He probably hadn't fallen asleep until just a little while ago. She'd hardly known where she was going while the Gloriella tore through her. 
All she'd known was that she had to get somewhat place safe. And somehow, she wound up exactly where she knew she'd be safest. And that was chapter 13. We love Kale. Kale's great. On chapter 14. Helena absolutely hated that it took a fair amount of courage to enter the royal library after coming upon that thing a few nights ago. And more than that, she hated that the encounter had turned her favorite place in the castle into something unknown and possibly deadly. She felt a little foolish as she shoved open the towering oak doors to the library. Armed to the teeth, most of her weapons concealed from sight. No need to have someone start asking why the king's champion was going into the library looking like she was walking onto a killing field. Not feeling at all inclined to go into Riphold after last night, she'd opted to spend the day digesting what she'd learned in Davis's office and searching for any connection between that book of word marks and the king's plans. And since she'd only seen one hint of something being amiss in the castle, well, She'd steeled her nerve to try to learn what that thing had been looking for in the library, or if there was any hint of where it had gone. The library looked as it always had, dim, cavernous, achingly beautiful in its ancient stone architecture and endless corridors lined with books, and totally silent. She knew there were a few scholars and librarians about, but they mostly kept to their private studies. The size of the place was overwhelming, it was a castle in itself. What had that thing been doing here? She craned her head back to take in the two upper levels, both bordered with ornate railings. Iron chandeliers cast light and shadow throughout the main chamber in which she stood. She loved this room, loved the scattering of heavy tables and red velvet chairs, and the worn couches sprawled before massive hearths. Selena paused beside the table she had always used when researching the word marks a table at which she spent hours with Kaol. Three levels that she could see. Plenty of places to hide on all of them. Rooms and alcoves and half-crumbling staircases. What about beneath this level? The library was probably too far away to connect to the tunnels attached to her rooms. But there could be more forgotten places beneath the castle. The polished marble floor gleamed under her feet. Kale had said something once about a legend regarding a second library underground, and catacombs and tunnels. If she were doing something she didn't want others to find out about, if she were some foul creature who needed a place to hide, maybe she was a fool for looking into it. But she had to know. Maybe this thing would be able to give her some clues as to what was going on in this castle. She headed for the nearest wall, and was soon swallowed up in the gloom of the stacks. It took her a few minutes to reach the perimeter wall, which was interspersed with bookcases and chipped writing desks. She pulled a piece of chalk from her pocket and drew an X on one of the desks. Most of the library probably looked the same after a while. It would be helpful to know when she would made a full sweep of the perimeter, even if it took her hours to cover it all. She passed stack after stack of books. Some of the cases plain, some of them ornately carved. Sconces were few and far enough apart that she often had to take several steps in near darkness. The floor had turned from gleaming marble to ancient gray blocks, and the scrape of her boots against stone was the only sound. It felt as if she it had been the only sound for a thousand years. But someone must have come down this passageway to light the sconces. So if she became lost, she might not stay that way forever. Not that getting lost was a possibility, she reassured herself, as the silence of the library became a living thing. She'd been trained to mark and remember pathways and exits and turns. She'd be fine. Odds were that she had to go back as odds were that she had to go as far back into the library as possible, to a place where even the scholars didn't bother going. There had been a day, she recalled, a day when she'd been poring over the walking dead, and she'd felt something under her boots. Kale had later revealed that he'd been dragging his dagger along the floor to spook her, but the initial vibration had been different, like someone drawing a claw along stone. 
Stop it, she told herself. Stop it now. Your imagination is absurd. It was just KL teasing you. She didn't know how long she'd been walking when she finally hit another wall. A corner. The bookcases were all carved from ancient wood, their ends shaped into centuries, guards forever protecting the books held between them. It was here that the sconces ran out, and a glance down the back wall of the library revealed utter darkness. Thankfully, one of the scholars had left a torch beside the last sconce. It was small enough that it wouldn't burn the whole damn library down, but also too small to last long. She could end it now and go back to her rooms to contemplate ways to pry information from Ar Archer's clients. One wall had been explored, one wall that revealed nothing. She could do the back wall tomorrow. She was here already. Selena picked up the torch. Dorian jerked awake at the sound of a clock chiming, and found himself sweating despite the fierce cold in his bedroom. It was odd enough that he'd fallen asleep, but the frigid temperature was what struck him most struck him as most unusual. His windows were all sealed, his door shut, yet his shallow breaths clouded in front of him. He sat up, his head aching. A nightmare, of teeth and shadows and glinting daggers. Just a nightmare. Dorian shook his head, the temperature in the room already increasing. Perhaps it had only been a rogue draft. The nap was just the product of staying up too late last night, the nightmare probably triggered by hearing from Kaol about Selena's encounter. He gritted his teeth. Her job wasn't without risk, and though he was furious about what had happened, he had a feeling he, she'd only push him away farther if he yelled at her about it. Dorian shook off the last bit of the cold and walked to his dressing room to change his wrinkled tunic. As he turned, he could have sworn he caught a glimpse of a faint ring of frost around where his body had lain on the couch. But when he looked back to see it more fully, there was nothing there. Selena heard a distant clock chime somewhere. It didn't quite believe it when she heard the time. She'd been here for three hours. Three hours. The back wall wasn't like the side wall. It dipped and curved and had closets and alcoves and little study rooms full of mice and dust. And just when she'd been about to draw an X on the wall and call it a day, she noticed the tapestry. She saw it only because it was the sole bit of decoration she'd encountered along the wall. Considering how the last six months of her life had gone, part of her just knew it had that it had to mean something. There was no depiction of Elena, or a stag, or anything lovely in green. No, this tapestry, woven from red thread, so dark it looked black, depicted nothing. She touched the ancient strands, marveling at the hue so deep that it seemed to swallow her fingers in its darkness. The hair on the back of her neck rose, and Slata put a hand on her dagger as she pulled the tapestry aside. She swore, and swore again. Another secret door greeted her. Glancing around the stacks, listening for any footsteps or rustle of clothing, Selena pushed it open. A breeze, musty and thick, floated past her from the depths of the spiral stairwell revealed by the open door. The light of her torch reached only a few feet inside, illuminating ornately carved walls depicting a battle. There was a thin groove in the marble wall, a channel barely three inches deep. It curved along the entire length of the wall, extending beyond the limits of her sight. She swiped her finger in the groove. It was smooth as glass and held a faint residue of something slimy. A small silver lamp hung from the wall, and she put her torch in its place as she took down the lamp, liquid splashing inside. Clever, she murmured. Smiling to herself, making sure her torch was far enough away, Selena placed the center nozzle of the lamp into the groove and tipped. Oil poured out and traveled down the chute. Selena grabbed her torch and touched it to the wall. Instantly, the groove glowed with fire providing a thin line of light all the way down the dark and cobbled stairwell, cobwebbed stairwell. A hand on her hip, she stared down, admiring the engraved surface of the walls. She doubted anyone would come looking for her, but she still put the tapestry back into its original position and took out one of her long daggers. As she descended, the images of battle shifted and moved in the firelight. She could have sworn that those stone faces turned to watch her go. She stopped looking at the walls. A breath of cold air brushed her face, and she at last spied the bottom of the stair. It was a dark corridor that smelled of aged and rotting things. A torch lay discarded at the bottom of the step, covered with enough cobwebs to reveal that no one had been down here in a long, long time. Unless that thing can see in the dark. She shoved away that thought, too, and picked up the torch, igniting it on the illuminated wall of the stairwell. Cobwebs hung from the arched ceiling 
grazing over the cobblestone floor. Rickety bookcases lined the hallway, the shelves crammed full of books so worn that Selena couldn't read the titles. Scrolls and pieces of parchment were stuffed into every nook and cranny, or lay unrolled on the sagging wood as if someone had just walked away from reading them. Somehow, it was more of a tomb than Elena's resting place. She walked down the corridor, stopping occasionally to examine the scrolls. They were maps and receipts from kings long since turned to dust. Castle records. All this walking and fretting and, you've and all you've discovered is useless castle records? That's probably what the creature was after. An ancient king's grocery bill. Beginning to chant of truly despicable curses, Selena waved her torch before her and walked on until a hallway appeared on the left. It had to lead even lower than Elena's tomb. But how deep? There was a lantern and a groove in the wall, so Selena once again lit the spiraling passage. This time, the gray stone depicted a forest. A forest and... Fay. It was impossible to miss those delicately pointed ears and elongated canines. The Fay lounged and danced and played music content to bask in their immortality and ethereal beauty. No, the king and his cronies couldn't know about this place, because they certainly would have defaced these carvings by now. Selena didn't need a historian to know that this stairwell was old, far older than the one throughout which, through which she had just descended, perhaps even older than the castle itself. Why had Gavin picked this site to build his castle? Had there been something here before? Or something beneath it worth hiding? A cold sweat slithered down her spine as she peered into the stairwell. Against all odds, another breeze wafted up from below. Iron. It smelled like iron. The images on the walls flickered as she descended in the spiral staircase. When she at last reached the bottom, she took a shallow breath and ignited a torch from a nearby bracket. She was in a long hallway, paved in gray stones. There was only one door in the center of the left-hand wall, and no exit save for the stairs behind her. She scanned the hall. Nothing. Not even a mouse. After observing for another moment, she stepped down it, igniting the few torches on the wall as she went. The iron door was unremarkable, though undeniably impenetrable. Its sudden, its studded surface was like a slab of starless sky. Selena stretched out a hand, but stopped before her fingers could graze the metal. Why was it made entirely of iron? Iron was the one element immune to magic. She remembered that much. There had been so many kinds of magic wielders ten years ago. People whose power was believed by some to have long ago originated from the gods themselves, despite the king of Adderland's claim that magic was a front to the divine. Wherever it came from, magic had countless var variations. Abilities to heal, abil to shapeshift, to summon flame or water or storms, to encourage the growth of crops and plants, to glimpse the future, and on and on. Most of those gifts had been watered down over the millennia, but for some rare strong ones, when they held on to their power too long, the iron in their blood caused fainting spells, or worse. She had seen hundreds of doors in the castle, doors of wood, doors of bronze, of glass, but never one of solid iron. This one was ancient, from a time when an iron door meant something. So was this supposed to keep someone out, or to keep something in? Selena touched the eye of Elena, scanning the door again. It yielded no answers about what might be behind it, so she clamped a handle around the handle and pulled. It was locked. There was no keyhole in sight. She ran a hand along the grooves. Perhaps it had rusted shut. She frowned. No sign of rust either. Selena stepped back, studying the door. Why put a handle on it if there was no way of opening it? And why use a lock unless there was something worthwhile hidden behind it? She turned away. But the amulet warmed against her skin, and a flicker of light shone through her tunic. Selena paused. It could have been the flicker of the torch, but Selena studied the slender gap between the door and the stone. A shadow, darker than the blackness beyond, lingered on the other side. Slowly, drawing out her thinnest and flattest dagger with her free hand, she set the torch down and lay on her stomach, as close to the door as she dared. Just shadows. It was just shadows. Or rats. Either way, she had to know. With absolute silence, she slid the shining dagger under the door. The reflection along the blade revealed nothing but darkness. Darkness and torchlight. She shifted the dagger, pushing it just a bit farther beneath. Two gleaming green-gold orbs flashed in the shadows behind. She lunged back, swiping the dagger with her, biting down on her lip to keep from cursing aloud. Eyes. Eyes gleaming in the dark. 
eyes like in and she sighed through her mouth relaxing her mouth relaxing slightly eyes like an animal like a rat or a mouse or some feral cat still she crept forward again holding her breath as she angled the blade under the door to scan the darkness nothing absolutely nothing she watched the dagger's blade for a full minute waiting for those eyes to reappear but whatever it was had scuttled off a rat it was probably a rat still selena couldn't shake the chill that had wrapped around her or ignore the warmth of the amulet at her neck even if there wasn't a creature behind that door layers lay answers lay behind it and she'd find them just not today not until she was ready because there might be ways to get through that door and considering how old this place was she had a feeling that the power that had sealed it was connected to the word marks but if there was something behind the door she shifted the fingers of her right hand as she picked up her torch studying the arc of scars left by the ritorex bite it was just a rat and she had no interest none in being proven wrong right now that chapter 14. How long was chapter 15? Chapter 15 is not too long. We could do another chapter. <laughs> Thank you, Lilith, for the cat ears. Cat ears are back. Okay. Chapter 15. The great hall was packed at dinner that night. Though Selena usually preferred to eat in her rooms, when she heard that Raina Goldsmith would be performing during the meal to honor Prince Holland's return, she crammed herself into the, one of the long tables in the back. It was the only place where the lesser nobility, some of Chaos' higher-born men, and any others who wanted to brave the viper's nest of the court were allowed to sit. The royal family dined at their table atop the dais in front of the hall with Parrington, Roland, and a ro woman who looked like she might be Roland's mother. From the other side of the room, Selena could hardly see little Prince Holland, but he seemed to be pale, rotund, and blessed with a head full of ebony curls. It seemed rather unfair to put Holland next to Dorian, where comparisons could easily be made. And though she'd heard every nasty rumor about Holland, she couldn't help but feel a shred of pity for the boy. Kale, to her surprise, opted to sit beside her, five of his men joining them at the table. Though there were several guards posted around the room, she had no doubt that the ones at her table were just as alert and watchful as those stationed by the doors in the dais. Her table mates were all polite to her, wary, but polite. They didn't mention what had happened last night, but they did quietly ask how she was feeling. Ress, who had guarded her during the competition, seemed genuinely relieved that she was better, and was the chattiest of them all, gossiping as much as any old court hen. And then, Ress was saying, his boyish face set with fiendish delight, just as he got into her bed, stark naked as the day he was born, her father walked in. Winces and groans came from the guards, even Kale himself, and he dragged him out of bed by his feet, took him down the hall, and dumped him down the stairs. He was shrieking like a pig the whole time. Kale leaned back in his seat, crossing his arms. You would be too if someone were dragging your naked carcass across the ice-cold floor. He smirked at Russ, trying to, as Russ tried to deny it. Kale seemed so comfortable with the men. His body relaxed, eyes alight, and they respected him too, always glancing at him for approval, for confirmation, for support. As Selena's chuckle faded, Kale looked at her, his brows high. You're one to laugh. You moan about the cold floors more than anyone I know. She straightened as the guards gave hesitant smiles. If I recall correctly, you complain about them every time I wipe the floor with you when we spar. Oh ho! Russ cried, and Kale's brows rose higher. Selena gave him a grin. Dangerous words, Kale said. Do we need to go to the training hall to see if you can back them up? Well, as long as your men don't object to seeing you knocked on your ass. 
We certainly do not object that. Russ crowed. Kale shot him a look, more amused than warning. Russ quickly added, Captain. Kale opened his mouth to reply, but then a tall, slim woman walked onto the small stage erected along one side of the room. Selena craned her neck as Re Rena Goldsmith floated across the wooden platform to where a massive harp and a man with a violin waited. She'd seen Rena perform only once before, years ago at the Royal Theatre, on a cold winter night like this. For two hours, the theatre was so still that it seemed as if everyone had stopped breathing. Rena's voice had floated through Selena's head for days afterward. From their table, Selena could hardly see Rena, just enough to tell that she wore a long green dress. No petticoats, no corset, no ornamentation save for the woven leather belt circling her narrow hips. And that her red gold hair was unbound. Silence rippled through the hall, and Raina courts curtsied to the dais. When she took her seat before the green and gold harp, the spectators were waiting. But how long would the court's interest hold? Rena nodded to the reedy violinist, and her long, white fingers began plucking out a melody on the harp. After a few notes, the rhythm established itself, followed by the slow, sad sweep of the violin. They wove together, blending, lifting, up, 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 until Raina opened her mouth. And when she sang, the whole world faded. Her voice was soft, ethereal, the sound of a lullaby half-remembered. The songs she sang, one by one, held Selena in place. Songs of distant lands, of forgotten legends, of lovers forever waiting to be reunited. Not a single soul stirred in the hall. Even the servants remained along the walls and in doorways and alcoves. Raina paused between songs, only long enough to allow a heartbeat of applause before the harp and the violin began anew, and she hypnotized them all once more. And then Raina looked toward the dais. This song, she said softly, is in honor of the esteemed royal family who invited me here tonight. This song was an ancient legend, an old poem actually, one Selena hadn't heard since childhood and never set to music. She heard it now as if for the first time, the story of a fey woman blessed with a horrible profound power that was sought by kings and lords in every kingdom. While they used her to win wars and conquer nations, they all feared her and kept her distance. It was a bold song to sing. Dedicating it to the king's family was even bolder. But the royals made no outcry. Even the king just stared blankly at Reyna, as though she weren't singing about the very power he outlawed ten years ago. Perhaps her voice could conquer even a tyrant's heart. Perhaps there was an unstoppable magic inherent in music and art. Reyna went on, spinning the ageless story of the years that the fey woman served those kings and lords, and a loneliness that consumed her bit by bit. And then... One day, a knight came, seeking her power on behalf of his king. As they traveled to his kingdom, his fear turned to love, and he saw her not for the power she wielded before the woman beneath. Of all the kings and emperors who had come courting her with promises of wealth beyond imagining, it was the knight's gift of seeing her for who she was, not what she was, that won her heart. Slana didn't know when she began crying. Somehow, she skipped a breath, and it set her lips wobbling. She shouldn't cry, not here. Not with these people around her, but then a warm, calloused hand grasped hers beneath the table, and she turned her head to find Kaol looking at her. He smiled slightly, and she knew he understood. So Selena looked at her captain of the guard and smiled back. Holland was squirming beside him, hissing and grousing about how bored he was and what a stupid performance this was, but Dorian's attention was on the long table at the back of the hall. Raina Goldsmith's unearthly music wove through the cavernous space, wrapping them in a spell that he would have called magic had he not known better. But Selena and Kale just sat there, staring at each other. And not just staring, but something more than that. Dorian stopped hearing the music. She had never looked at him like that. Not once, not even for a heartbeat. Raina was finishing her song, and Dorian tore his eyes away from them. He didn't think anything had happened between them. Not yet. Kale was stubborn and loyal enough to never make his move, or to even realize that he looked at Selena the same way she looked at him. Holland's complaining grew louder, and Dorian took a long, long breath. He would move on, because he would not be like the ancient kings in the song and kept her for himself, and keep her for himself. She deserved a loyal, brave knight who saw her for what she was and did not fear her. And he deserved someone who would look at him like that, even if the love wouldn't be the same, even if the girl wouldn't be her. So Dorian closed his eyes and took another long breath, 
and when she and when he opened his eyes, he let her go. Hours later, the king of Adderland stood at the back of the dungeon chamber and his secret guards as his secret guards dragged Raina Goldsmith forward. The butcher's block at the center of the room was already soaked with blood. Her companion's headless corpse lay a few feet away, his blood trickling toward the drain in the floor. Parrington and Roland stood silent beside the king, watching, waiting. The guards shoved the singer to her knees before the stain sewn. One of them grabbed a fistful of her red gold hair and yanked, forcing her to look at the king as he stepped forward. It is punishable by death to speak of or to encourage magic. It is an affront to the gods, an affront to me, that you sang such a song in my hall. Raina Goldsmith just stared at him, her eyes bright. She hadn't struggled when his men grabbed her after her after the performance, or even screamed when they'd beheaded her companion, as if she'd been expecting this. Any last words? A queer, calm rage settled over her lined face, and she lifted her chin. I have worked for ten years to become famous enough to gain an invitation to this castle. Ten years so I could come here to sing the songs of magic that you tried to wipe out. So I could sing those songs and you would know that we are still here. That you may outlaw magic, that you may slaughter thousands, but we who keep the old ways still remember. Behind him, Roland snorted. Enough, the king said and snapped his fingers. The guards shoved her head down on the block. My daughter was sixteen, she went on. Tears ran over the bridge of her nose and onto the block, but her voice remained strong and loud. Sixteen when you burned her. Her name was Kayleen, and she had eyes like thunderclouds. I still hear her voice in my dreams. The king jerked his chin to the executioner, who stepped forward. My sister was thirty-six. Her name was Liesa, and she had two boys who were her joy. The executioner raised his axe. My neighbor and his wife were seventy. Their names were John and Estrel. They were killed because they dared to try to protect my daughter when your men came for her. Rena's goldsmith was still reciting her list of the dead when the axe fell. And that is chapter 15. It's an intense chapter. It is a very intense chapter at the end there. Very, very intense chapter. Yeah, it's 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 powerful. It's deep for sure. <sighs> okay, the next chapter is 10 pages. I think I can manage it, but it'll probably be our last chapter of the night unfortunately, because it's very hot and that does not help me being out of breath. Elena dipped her spoon into her porridge, tasted it, then dumped it in a mountain, then dumped in a mountain of sugar. I much prefer eating breakfast together than going out in the freezing cold. Fleetfoot, her head on Selena's lap, hu lap, huffed loudly. I think she does too, she added with a grin. Nehemia laughed softly before taking a bite of her bread. It seems like this is the only time of day either of us gets to see you, she said in Eowe. I've been busy. Busy hunting down the conspirators of the king's list? A pointed glance in her direction. Another bite of toast. What do you want me to say? Selena stirred the sugar into her porridge, focusing on that instead of the look on her friend's face. I want you to look me in the eye and tell me that you think your freedom is worth this price. Is this why you've been so on edge lately? Nehemia set down her toast. How can I tell my parents about you? What excuses can I make up that will convince them that my friendship with the king's champion... She used the common tongue language for the two words, spitting them out like poison. Is in any way an honorable thing. How can I convince them that your soul isn't rotted? I didn't realize that I need parental that I needed parental approval. You're in a position of power and knowledge, and yet you just obey. You obey and you do not question, and you work only towards one goal. Your freedom. Selena shook her head and looked away. You turn from me because you know it's true. And what is so wrong with wanting my freedom? Haven't I suffered enough to deserve it? So what if it means so what if the means are unpleasant? I won't deny that you have suffered, Alentia, but there are thousands more who have also suffered, and suffered more, 
and they do not sell themselves to the king to get what they, too, deserve. With each person you kill, I am finding fewer and fewer excuses for remaining your friend. Selena flung her spoon down on the table and stalked to the fireplace. She wanted to rip down the tapestries and the paintings and smash all the silly little baubles and ornaments she'd bought to decorate her room. Mostly, she just wanted to make Nehemia stop looking at her like that. Like she was just as bad as the monster who sat on the glass throne. She took a breath, then another, listening for signs of anyone else in her chambers, then turned. I haven't killed anyone, she said softly. Nehemia went still. What? I haven't killed anyone. She remained where she was standing, needing the distance between them to get the words out right. I faked all of their deaths and helped them flee. Nehemia ran her hands over her face, smearing the powdered gold she dusted on her eyelids. After a moment, she lowered her fingers. Her dark, lovely eyes were wide. You haven't killed a single person he's ordered you to kill? Not a single one. What about Archer Finn? I offered Archer a bargain. I gave him till the end of the month to get his affairs in order before he fakes his death and flees, and he gives me information about the actual enemies of the king. She could tell Nehemia the rest of it later. The king's plans, the library catacombs, but mentioning those things now would only bring up too many questions. Nehemia took a sip of her tea, the liquid inside the cup sloshing as her hands shook. He'll kill you if he finds out. Selena looked to the balcony doors where a beautiful day was dawning in the wide open world beyond. I know. And this information that Archer is giving you, what will you do with it? What sort of information is it? Selena briefly explained what he told her about the people involved in putting Terrison's lost heir back on the throne, even telling her what had happened with Davis. Nehemia's face paled. When Selena finished, Nehemia took another trembling sip of tea. And you trust Archer? I think he values his life more than he values anything else. He's a courtesan. How can you be sure you can trust him? Selena slipped back into her chair, Fleetfoot curling between her feet. Well, you trust me, and I'm an assassin. It's not the same. Selena looked to the tapestry along the wall to her left, and the chest of drawers in front of it. While I'm telling you all the things that could get me executed, there's something else that I should bring up. Nehemia followed her line of sight to the tapestry. After a moment, she let out a gasp. Is that... That's Elena in the tapestry, isn't it? Selena smiled crookedly and crossed her arms. But that's not even the worst of it. As they walked down to the tomb, Selena told Nehemia about everything that had occurred between her and Elena since Sam Hewen, and all the adventures that had befallen her. She showed her the room where Cain had summoned the Ritterac, and as they approached the tomb, Selena winced as she remembered one miserable new detail. Brought a friend? Nehemia yelped. Selena greeted the bronze skull-shaped knocker. Hello, Mort. Nehemia squinted at the skull. How is this? She looked over her shoulder at Selena. How is this possible? Ancient spells and nonsense, Selena said, cutting Mort off as he began to recite the story of how King Brandon created him. Someone used a spell with the word marks. Someone? Mort sputtered. That someone is. Shut it, Selena said, and flung open the tomb door, letting Nehemia inside. Save it for someone who cares. Mort huffed what sounded like a violent stream of curses, and Nehemia's eyes twinkled as they entered the tomb. It's incredible, the princess whispered, gazing at the walls where the word marks had been written. What does it say? Death, eternity, rulers, Nehemia recited. Standard tomb posturing. She continued moving through the room. As Nehemia strode about, Selena leaned against the wall and slumped to the ground. Sighing, she rubbed her heel against one of the raised stars on the floor, examining the curve that they made across the room. Do they make a constellation? Selena rose to her feet and stared down. Nine of the stars made up a familiar pattern. The dragonfly. Her brows rose. She'd never realized it before. A few feet away, another constellation lay at the floor. The wyvern. It sat at the head of Gavin's sarcophagus. A symbol of Adderland's house, as well as the second constellation in the sky. Selena followed the line, that the shapes made, weaving through the tomb. The night sky passed beneath her feet. By the time she reached the final constellation, she would have collided with the wall had Nehemia not grabbed her by the arm. What is it? Selena was staring down at the last constellation. The stag, Lord of the North. The symbol of Terrison, Elena's home country. The const constellation faced the wall, and its head seemed to point upward, as though it were looking at something. Selena followed the stag stare up through the dozens of word marks that covered the wall until, By the word, look at this, she said, pointing. An eye, no larger than her palm, was etched into the wall. 
a hole was bored in its center, a perfectly crafted puncture that had been carefully concealed within the eye. The, eye mar the word mark itself made a face, and while the other eye was filled in with s and smooth, this one held a hollowed out iris. It is only with the eye that one can see brightly. There was no sh way she was that lucky. It was surely no more than a coincidence. Calming her growing excitement, she lifted onto her toes to see into the eye. How had she not noticed this before? She took a step back and the word mark faded into the wall. She stepped back onto the constellation and it appeared again. You can only see the face when you stand on the stack, Nehemia whispered. Selena ra ran her hands over her face, feeling for any cracks or slight breezes that might suggest a door into another room. Nothing. With a, with a deep breath, she rose onto her toes and faced the eye. Her dagger held aloft in case anything leapt out at her. Nehemia chuckled softly, and Selena conceded a smile as she put her eye against the stone and peered into the gloom. There was nothing, just a distant wall illuminated by a small shaft of moonlight. It's just... it's just a blank wall. Does that make any sort of sense? She'd been jumping to conclusions, trying to see things and make connections that weren't there. Selena stepped away so Nehemia could see for herself. Mort! she hollered while the princess looked. What the hell is that wall? Does it make any sense to you why it would be there? No, Mort said dully. Don't lie to me. Lie to you? To you? Oh, I couldn't lie to you. You asked me whether it makes sense, and I said no. You must learn to a ask the right questions before you can receive the right answers. Selena growled. What sort of questions might I ask to receive the right answer? Mort clicked his tongue. I'll have none of that. Come back when you have some proper questions. You promise you'll tell me then? I'm not a door knock. I'm a door knocker. It's not in my nature to make promises. Nehemia stepped away from the wall and rolled her eyes. Don't listen to his teasing. I can't see anything either. Perhaps it's just a prank. Old castles are full of nonsense intended only to confuse and bother later generations. But all these word marks. Selena looked, took a too short breath, then made the request that she'd been contemplating for some time now. Could you... Could you teach me how to read them? Oh, crackled Mork from the hall. Are you sure you're not too dim to understand? Selena ignored him. She hadn't told Nehemia about Elena's latest demand to uncover the king's source of power, because she knew what Nehemia's response would be. Listen to the dead queen. But the word mark seemed so connected to everything, somehow, even to that eye riddle and this stupid trick wall. And perhaps if she learned how to use them, then she could unlock the iron door in the library and find some answers beyond it. Maybe, maybe just the basics? Nehemia smiled. The basics are the hardest part. Usefulness aside, it was a forgotten secret language, a system for accessing a strange power. Who wouldn't want to learn about it? Warning lessons instead of our walk then? Nehemia beamed, and Selena felt a twinge of guilt for not telling her about the catacombs, as the princess said, Of course! When they left, Nehemia spent a few minutes studying Mort, mostly asking him questions about his creation spell, which he claimed to have forgotten, then claimed was too private, and then claimed she had no business hearing. After Nehemia's near-infinite patience wore thin, they cursed Mort soundly and stormed back upstairs, where Fleetfoot was anxiously waiting in the bedroom. The dog refused to set foot in the secret passage, probably because of some foul stench left over from Cain and his creature. Even Nehemia had been, hadn't been able to coax her downstairs with them. Once the door was closed and hidden, Selena leaned against her desk. The eye in the tomb hadn't been the solution to the riddle. Now she wondered if Nehemia might have a better sense of what it was about. I found a book on word marks in Davis's office, she told Nehemia. I can't tell if it's a riddle or a proverb, but someone wrote this on the inside back cover. It is only with the eye that one can see rightly. Nehemia frowned. Sounds like an idle lord's nonsense to me. But do you think it's just a coincidence that he was a part of this movement against the king and had a book on word marks? What if this is some sort of riddle about them? Nehemia snorted. What if Davis wasn't even in this group? Perhaps Archer had his information wrong. I bet that book had been there for years, and I bet Davis didn't even know it existed. Or maybe he saw it in a bookshop and brought it to, um, and bought it to look daring. But maybe he didn't. And maybe Archer was onto something. She would question him when she saw him next. 
Selena fiddled with the chain on her, of her amulet, then went rod straight. The eye. Do you think it could be this eye? No, Nehemia said. It wouldn't be that easy. But Selena pushed off the desk. Trust me, Nehemia said. It's a coincidence. Just like that eye in the wall. The eye could refer to anything. Anything at all. Having eyes plastered all over things used to be quite popular centuries ago as a ward against evil. You'll drive yourself mad, Alentia. I can do some research on the subject, but it might take a while before I find anything. Selena's face warmed. Fine. Maybe she was wrong. Maybe she didn't want to believe Nehemia, didn't want to think that the riddle could be that impossible to solve. But the princess knew far more about ancient lore than she did. So Selena sat down at her breakfast table again. Her porridge had gone cold, but she ate it anyway. Thank you, she said in between mouthfuls, as Nehemia sat down again too, for not exploding on me. Nehemia laughed. Valentia, I'm honestly surprised you told me. An opening and closing door, then footsteps. Then Philippa knocked and bustled in, carrying a letter for Selena. Good morning, beautiful ladies, she clucked, making Nehemia grin. A letter for our most esteemed champion. Selena beamed at Philippa and took it. Her smile grew as she read the contents once the service left. It's from Archer, she told Nehemia. He's given me some names of people who might be involved in this movement people associated with Davis. She was a little shocked he'd risk putting it all in a letter. Perhaps she needed to teach him a thing or two about code writing. Nehemi had stopped smiling, though. What sort of man just hands out this information like it's nothing more than morning gossip? A man who wants his freedom and has had enough of serving pigs. Selena folded the letter and stood. If the men on this list were anything like Davis, then perhaps handing them over to the king and using them as leverage wouldn't be so horrible after all. I should get dressed. I need to go into the city. She was halfway to her dressing room when she turned. We'll have our first lesson over breakfast tomorrow. Nehemia nodded, digging into her food again. It took her all day to hunt down the men, to learn where they lived, whom they spoke to, how well guarded they were. None of it yielded anything useful. She was tired and cranky and hungry when she trudged back to the castle at sundown, and her mood only took a turn for the worse when she arrived at her rooms and found a note from Kale. The king had commanded her to be on guard duty yet again for the royal ball that night. And that was chapter 16. <sighs> but I think that is where we are going to call it for tonight.